So thank you, Jeff. Hello, everyone. My name is Clint Hilliard, and I'm the Programs Director for Nkosi Chesapeake, and I want to welcome everyone tonight for attending tonight's virtual lecture. Uh, a couple preliminaries. Um, Paul's, Paul Martin's going to be sort of helping with the technical uh, presentation here, and uh, uh, Dr. Eisner, he'll be, uh, he'll be like handling your slides for you. Once, once I'm done here, he'll put up the slides. Um, as usual, we'll be raffling a door prize to one lucky attendee tonight. We'll be uh, populating the raffle wheel with names from the Eventbrite registrations, and I'll be using your registration emails to contact uh, you if you're a lucky winner. <clears throat> uh, secondly, uh, there'll be time uh, after the talk for questions. We want to keep it brief. Maybe um, we'll do, uh, you know, no more than 10 minutes um, simply because we've got the, um, the, the ceremony after this. And then if people want to stick around after that, we'll be more, more than happy to keep the, the lines open and then people can drop off if they want. So, um, but, so, so question time after, but I'll also leave it to our speaker. If you put your questions in the chat, chat room and he wants to answer them, in situ, then, then that's fine too. So now, tonight we're very honored to start off our speaker series for 2021 with one of um, the profession's most experienced systems engineers. A man whose career has, as tonight's talk title alludes to, uh, it spans a combined 50 years in both industry and academia not just performing systems engineering, but as a powerful force in creating it, shaping it, evolving it to what it has become today. His experience with industry covers a complete spectrum from working a working engineer to management to eventually holding executive and president positions in high tech companies. Moving beyond his commercial experience, his career extends extensively into academia having been Professor of Engineering Management and Distinguished Research Professor at the George Washington University. He's taught courses in systems engineering, technical enterprises, project management, information theory. Uh, since 2013, he served as Professor Emeritus at GWU. He is also a life fellow of both NCOSI and IEEE professional associations. He has written many books relating to engineering management systems, and of course, systems engineering. Uh, tonight's uh, lecture is based on his latest title and it will also be our door prize tonight. And so with all of that, I'm going to now turn this presentation over to our speaker, um, Dr. Howard Eisner. Um, are you there? Dr. Eisner. Hello. Do I, do I click on? Yep, we can hear you. Don't worry about click. Paul, can you see okay, the screen? I'm good. You can hear me and yep. uh, the last slides are up, so we're yep. fine. Yep. And I'll, I'll forward them. Uh, just say next slide and I'll take care of it. Okay. All right. Um, that's uh, the intro and thank you, Clinton, for the uh, brief overview. I'm really pleased to be uh, talking again to our chapter and um, uh, very few people get a chance to talk about their experiences. <laughs> um, only 50 years of it, but um, I can do it in 10 or 15 minutes if I talk quickly. Um, so let's go to the first slide. There are only six slides and um, um, I you will see uh, the items listed and there they are. Okay, I'm not gonna do 50, um, um, 50 years of it. Um, I picked uh, sort of like the top 20 for this evening since uh, we have the time limitations. And um, number one is go, go back to fundamentals, uh, which raises the question, of course, uh, what, is, what is a fundamental? Uh, for me, an example was many, many years ago, um, I, was, um, I, I was a young engineer and I got an assignment. And the assignment was strange because I hadn't been in, uh, in the field very, very long. And uh, the particular assignment was to figure out 
the performance of torpedoes in shallow water. Um, well, I studied electrical engineering, but I didn't study torpedoes. So uh, basically, I looked around for any information about torpedoes and uh, test data on torpedoes, and I looked and I looked and I looked. I really couldn't find an answer to the question, how are they going to perform in shallow water? So happily, I, I finally decided, well, what's the, what's the physics of the whole situation? And the physics of it basically said, uh, look, there's this thing known as the sonar range equations. Let's go back to that. So at uh, the ripe age of 25, I, I discovered the fundamental. Let's go back to the physics of the problem. And that turned out to uh, be a, a useful idea uh, going forward for many years. What are, what are the fundamentals of the problem? And usually, or often, I should say, the physics of the problem goes back to uh, go, the, the, the fundamentals go back to the physics of the problem. So that's num number one. We played a game, my wife and I, with our grandchildren on this issue not too long ago. We took them out to dinner and we were talking about entrepreneurship. These are 20 year olds and uh, they, they love to talk about it. And so uh, we said, well, how about this? Um, we got a, an entrepreneurial idea for you. Um, go out there and, and um, invent uh, a steak uncooker. And uh, they, they loved the idea. They said, boy, we're going to make a fortune. Uh, thank you for the idea. Um, a week later, they called back and said, um, sorry, Grandpa, um, it violates the second law of thermodynamics. So, um, so they've got the idea. Go back to fundamentals and see what's workable and what's not. Okay, number two. And uh, by the way, if you want to chime in and ask questions, um, I'm happy to take them as we go. Okay, uh, number two. Read and reread uh, Eberhard Recton. There's the copy of the book. Thank you for putting that up there. Recton is a um, a star in in the field, or was a star. He passed away some years ago uh, in the field. Um, having done um, superlative work in really all three dimensions, academia and uh, running uh, companies and so forth. And he wrote this uh, seminal book on architecting. Uh, we'll come back to the architecting topic uh, a little later tonight. But basically, he set the stage for uh, what are called heuristics. And that's mostly what I'm talking about in reading it and rereading it. Um, in the back of that book, he has a list of, um, of what he calls heuristics and uh, being around systems as long as he was and being as smart as he was, uh, here, here are a few of them. Um, one is uh, keep requirements under challenge uh, during the entire process. Uh, I found that to be the case. Um, when the requirements documents are written, you're written with the least amount of knowledge about the system. So what do you do? You put down what you can and you put a bunch of TBDs kind of next to some of them. Um, keep them under challenge during the, the entire process. Um, here's another one. Um, no system can be optimal for all, all parties. So that means you got to be a bit more flexible in um, in trying to uh, figure out um, what what is an optimal uh, configuration. Uh, what is an optimal configuration for today, and what is it for for tomorrow, and for different uh, users of the system? Uh, that's a phone ringing. <laughs> Um, the design team cannot avoid redesign. Uh, Recton was a strong supporter of um, design and redesign, and I actually had several conversations with him um, personally along those lines. And then the last one, I, I'm not going to read more than a few, is uh, 
choose among alternative architectures. And even though he, he did sort of define the processes of architecting, uh, there are still some others, um, other alternatives, um, as we discussed uh, a few, uh, I guess it was a few months ago. So Rechton's uh, my superstar in the field, um, and um, I miss him. Okay, number three. Talk to and respect colleagues. Um, I think one of the opportunities that we, we uh, lose out on is that we don't recognize that the person that's sitting at the desk right next to us is an enormous source of inspiration, new ideas, and uh, um, the, the idea is don't be a lone wolf. Uh, talk to your buddies, talk to uh, your people sitting right next to you and ask them uh, questions and, uh, and let's see if you can get some good answers from them. Okay, number four, my experience with the captain. This is a little bit of a longer story and uh, I, I find it kind of interesting. Um, some years ago, like about 30 to 40, um, I was out on a marketing um, venture. Um, I had a title of executive VP of my company. So part of my job was to every now and then um, go out and uh, look for new business. Um, so I was on uh, basically a, a, a trip of that type and I found myself in a place called the um, Naval Missile Systems Engineering Station out at Port Wanimi, California. Uh, that was a long run for me. So once I got there, I tried to make the most of it. And I asked for an audience with the gentleman who, who ran the station. Um, the uh, highlight of the station uh, for me was to try to find out more about the basic point defense surface missile system. And um, so I, uh, by some good fortune, on that trip, the captain who ran the station decided to say hello to me and uh, uh, what, 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 what was I there about? So I basically told him I'm looking for business. <laughs> and um, he was the captain running the entire station. And um, he welcomed me and he said, well, let me think about this a minute. Uh, what are my problems? Maybe you can help with them. And after some discussion, he finally said, I think, I think the, the, one of the big problems I have is that I have a lot of staff. I have literally hundreds of people that work at the station. And we are working in, in some high technologies, especially surface mis uh, missile, anti-surface missile systems. And the basic point defense is my charge and my responsibility. Uh, so, um, can you help to figure out how to uh, improve the capabilities of my staff? I, I thought for a minute or a while and I said, well, you know, I have some ideas, but let me give me a little bit of time and I'll come back to you if I, if I have a good idea with a proposal. In those days, one of the things that you were able to do uh, in my situation was you're able to go to a customer and talk over a problem and and they would say, well, submit a proposal and you could submit a proposal without competition for three, four hundred thousand dollars. And that was enough for me at the time. So I, I did exactly that. I submitted a proposal and uh, sure, uh, shortly after that, I got a call back. Uh, the captain wants to talk to you. So uh, back on an airplane out to Port Wanimi and uh, we're talking and he says, I'd like you to I'd like you to execute this proposal. This is basically uh, building a handbook or a, a simulation handbook, if you will, of the basic point defense surface missile system. And uh, we can hand these out to all of our people and you can come and lecture about it and gain basic uh, uh, strength of knowledge in, in uh, all of the aspects of missile defense. So uh, that's exactly what happened. Except then on the second trip, uh, the, the captain invited 
me to take a trip with him around the base and he invited his wife as well. So I was just astonished by, by how warm this guy was and uh, how, how uh, inviting he was uh, to deal with. Now, um, shortly thereafter, um, as I got into the contract with him, he, I got a phone call from uh, his office and it said, the captain would like to write a paper on, the, uh, on what it is you're, you're doing for him. I said, okay. He said, no, you don't quite have the idea. The captain wants to, you to write the paper and he's gonna give it. <laughs> I said, I'm, I'm good with that. So some number of months later, we appeared together at the uh, Military Operations Research Society meeting in El Paso. And we, uh, we decided to meet in, in my, um, uh, uh, the, uh, the, room, the room that I, they gave me. And uh, he pulls out a bunch of slides and he says, I saw your slides and I can't give that paper. So I'm gonna give this other paper. He's, he's sitting on my bed at the time and he's cross-legged and he's got a bunch of slides in his hand. This is the captain. So we reached an agreement that he would give that paper and um, move on from there. So that's basically the story uh, of how, how inviting uh, people can be, even uh, military folks with all kinds of stuff on their, on their shirts. And the name of this captain was Captain Wayne Meyer. And shortly thereafter, he became Admiral Wayne Meyer. And shortly thereafter, he, he became, I'm sorry, he became Admiral Wayne Meyer and uh, was in charge of the entire Aegis program and uh, moved on from there. So I can tell you that captains and admirals can be really quite inviting and warm-hearted and easy to talk to. And so uh, don't be fooled by, by all of the hash on, on their uh, shirts. Uh, go, go talk to them and, um, and, and just uh, tell them what's on your mind. Okay, um, number five. Uh, a few months ago, we had a, another session, uh, as you may recall, about DODAF, uh, my uh, disaffinity for DODAF, and basically my conclusion that um, the whole issue of, um, um, of architecting systems really needs to be moved in the direction of a cost-effectiveness evaluation of alternatives. So um, I, I want to stress the point that that's uh, one of the lessons learned. And uh, I'm still uh, trying to do that in minor kinds of ways. And um, I'd say that's one of the uh, big, biggies. Um, I'm going to make another request in respect to this. Um, when I was here three or so months ago, and we discussed the approach to uh, an alternative approach to uh, DODAF. Somebody in the audience said they had developed some alternatives and they, uh, they had them uh, well underway and documented. So I wanna make a, another request that uh, whoever that was, I didn't get your name. If you can remember to send some of that in the mail to me, uh, I would appreciate it. Okay, let's move on. Um, Please, again, if you want to stop me and uh, ask a question or two, I'm happy to respond. Okay, number six. I think uh, there should be on everybody's desk, uh, is there a better way? Um, I, I never had it on my desk, but I had it in my head most of the time. Um, we're, in a, we're in the business as systems engineers. We're problem solvers. And uh, we get hit with problems, uh, you know, quite regularly. That's what our customers want us to be doing. And I think what we need to be doing is basically uh, asking this question just about all the time. And when we find that we think there really is a better way to the one that uh, we're working on now, or that the way in which our current customers are 
uh, leading us, we really should, um, with, with due respect, ask, that, ask this question. And um, we'll just leave it at that. Okay, number seven. Um, this has to do with um, improving our, our background and capability. And that almost always involves knowing where and how to get help. Um, I have a short uh, uh, story about that or tale. I was working on a program with Goddard Space Flight Center some years ago. And the deputy the director of the program came to me. I was a contractor. And he said, uh, you know, I'm concerned about um, the satellite. The satellite was called Nimbus. It was a three axis stabilized uh, satellite, weather satellite. I'm concerned about the possibility that after uh, one or two or multiple orbits, um, the satellite and the launch vehicle might hit each other and destroy the, destroy the satellite. I said, okay. He said, uh, can you can you work on that problem? I said, let me let me <laughs> let me think about it. So I went back to the office and I dragged out some old books and I try to write the orbital equations and try to formulate the problem. And I worked and I worked and I worked and I couldn't do it. Um, it was uh, it was just beyond me. So I uh, called up um, another uh, gentleman in the company. He was our lead mathematician. And um, I called him up and said, can we, can we chat for a while? So th that's exactly what happened was I went to his office and described the problem. And he, he said, let me think about it. And a couple of days later, he said, hey, come on up to my office. Let's talk. And sure enough, he had written the equations. He has basically uh, uh, come up with a, graphic, a graphical formulation of the orbital equations and uh, had it all plotted up. And he said, here's your answer. Your answer is no, they're not gonna, they're not gonna hit. So I went uh, a couple of days after that back to the customer to present it. And he said, well, I'm glad to hear it. And also you passed the test. He said, I gave the same problem to uh, computer sciences and they're the keeper of the orbital mechanics uh, models that we have. And they came to the conclusion that uh, they're not going to hit. So for me, it was a problem that I uh, was just beyond me at that uh, point, and it probably still is. <laughs> and um, so I went to uh, get help from uh, the right person at the right time. So you may find that uh, there are problems that are put on your desk and you don't know, like uh, you can't work them. And uh, so uh, you need a, a list of people to go to, to talk to uh, who are not, not right next to you, but uh, up a floor or two in your building. Okay, number uh, eight, um, redundancy and design is not obsolete. Um, we know that redundancy in design is uh, obviously a way to improve reliability. But what I have found over the last several years is that uh, we kind of uh, lost the fine art, if you will, of designing for uh, with redundancy. Um, my story about that is that basically uh, on that same Nimbus program, um, we had some ideas and I was working on, in particular on the power supply uh, system. And it was a three axis uh, stabilized uh, system with solar panels. And um, one of the recommendations I made was to put in redundant uh, drive motors for that uh, power supply. And um, as it turned out, um, that's how the system failed. And um, I went back to have a post-mortem with the program manager. And I said, uh, here it is on page so-and-so. He said, well, you didn't, <laughs> you didn't make the case strong enough. So I would advise you from time to time, when you see that there are ways, that there are single point failures in systems that you're working on, uh, take a very hard look at it and see if there's 
a way to uh, uh, not live with a single point failure and put in some redundancy and, uh, and argue your case and uh, more so than I did uh, many years ago. Okay, number nine, be part of a productive team. I would urge all, all uh, systems engineers to think uh, in terms of being part of a team. Uh, there's nothing quite like um, having that experience and feeling the uh, the impact that you have on system, on this system when you have other people working the, the problem right next to you and sharing their ideas and their information with you. Um, if you are currently not part of a productive team and you're a lone wolf, then I would urge you to um, look around <laughs> look around for some uh, ways to be part of a team. Okay, number 10. Um, do not try to uh, optimize. Um, that's actually one of Eberhard Recton's um, examples and his point is that the optimum for you it may be uh, different from the optimum from the um, a stakeholder uh, may be different from the optimum for uh, Captain Wayne Meyer. Um, systems are, are too complicated to uh, optimize their design. You can optimize parts of it, local parts of it. It's sort of like saying uh, local parts can be, can indeed uh, have optimal configurations. Um, People talk about entropy, for example, and say entropy uh, cannot be uh, decreased in the system. And the answer is yes, it can, as long as you're in, in a local environment or situation. Same is true of optimization. You can never hope to optimize an entire configuration in the systems that we build these days, which are as complicated as they tend to be. Do I have a uh, do I have a question here from Stephen? Uh, you can unmute Stephen. You want to? Yeah, Stephen. Uh -huh. Okay. Yeah, hello. Yes. Um, I'm just trying to understand your point here. Are, are you trying to say that we should uh, make the system configurable so the the, the uh, end uh, operator can optimize it through configuration settings or um, I don't think I'm quite saying that. I'm saying that um, um, there are people who approach a problem um, in, in a large scale complicated system and saying, we're, we're looking for an optimum and they keep working and working and working and working and working and seeking an optimum, but they never get there. So it's sort of like the, the optimum is the enemy of the very best. Um, more, more like something like that. Does that make sense? Yeah, especially if you never ship the product because you can never <laughs> quite optimize it, right? Yeah, yeah I mean, uh, so uh, know when to stop and to say that's that's uh, that that'll that'll that's fine. That meets the requirements. Let's move on. That kind of thing. Well, that makes sense. Okay, thank you. Okay, you're welcome. Uh, number eleven is um, consists of. Um, a bunch of things all on one, here it is. Some do's and don'ts with the customer. There, there are lots of do's and don'ts out there. These are just a few of them, but uh, <laughs> number one is no free lunches. Um, that uh, usually turns out to bite you um, in a place where you don't wanna get bitten. Uh, number two, well, the second on the list is anticipate new task orders. Uh, what that means is that uh, be slightly ahead of your customer in thinking about uh, what's the next step. Um, we haven't finished this current step, but what's the step after that and what's the step after that? And be prepared to put those task order ideas on the table before he or she asks you, uh, what should I be doing next? Or here's some ideas. 
So what that really means is uh, stay, stay ahead of your customer. Um, third item, um, have informal discussions with your customer on short and long-term goals that he or she has of your project. That goes hand in hand with the second one so that you gain some uh, first-hand knowledge and ahead of your competitors. A lot of programs these days are task orders where you actually compete on individual task orders. So you're always in a competitive environment. And what I'm saying here is, uh, again, try to be ahead, uh, slightly ahead, or if not wholly ahead of your competitors by um, uh, having these discussions. Uh, fourth item, um, try to understand his or her, meaning your customer's expectations of you. Um, one of the things that we often have trouble with is we don't really understand what the customer wants. Uh, what do you expect of us to be able to do? And um, there may be some things that uh, the customer expects that you currently can't do. And so you need to figure out how to uh, gain that capability. Uh, like the orbital mechanics problem. I couldn't do it, but somebody in my company could. And I was uh, happily able to bring that person uh, capability to bear on the problem. Okay. Um, and then finally, a uh, quick response. Um, many customers uh, I've run into over the years um, want a quick response, but they don't necessarily tell you that. So I think you need to be prepared to um, go to some type of quick response as a response to um, a problem or a new task order that they put on the table. So if you're thinking, uh, well, the customer doesn't need this answer uh, um, you know, by, um, by a month from now, and it turns out they need it next week, you're just going to be missing a lot of opportunities to uh, try to do the right thing. Okay, that's number 11. Uh, Dr. Eisner, I think uh, Sarah, yeah. Sarah Sheard had a question that she asked if you might expound a little bit more on the no lunches, uh, no free lunches, and how that would bite you. <laughs> Who, uh, who's asking the question? Uh, Sarah Sheard. I'll be darned. Sarah, hey, how are you doing? Um, Hi, Howard. Hey. Um, no free lunches means uh, it's against the rules of uh, procurement to take uh, and treat lunches, uh, even if uh, it's a $5 deal. So uh, that's my expounding. <laughs> oh, OK. Um, Sarah, nice to, nice to have you uh, with us here. Well, of course. Yeah, we have many, many topics to talk about. Over uh, lunch, over uh, lunch. Over lunch, yes. Okay, uh, number 12. Okay, build on others' contributions. Um, this one's pretty easy because um, we have some really concrete examples. Um, for, for example, suppose you're doing a... Uh, cost effectiveness study of, uh, of a system. And you realize that uh, you're an engineer, you don't know much about costs. You don't know how to configure a life cycle cost model and, and so on. So then you remember that there were a couple of things you ran into. One was called Kokomo 1 and one is called Kokomo 2. And um, both of them, um, formulated, if you will, by Barry Bame, uh, a mathematician who made what I think are some seminal contributions to uh, uh, cost modeling and uh, cost estimating relationships. So there's no point in you trying to do what Barry Bame spent years doing and uh, lots of money trying to figure out how to estimate the cost of software. Um, Barry's not the only one who's worked on that issue for years. There have been other software CERs, but uh, 
go go back to the literature and go call Barry and see where he is with uh, Kokomo 3, if he is anywhere. Okay, number 13. Uh, treat your new boss with respect. Um, us uh, systems engineers uh, tend to move uh, around a fair amount and um, this Friday we can be working on program X, but Monday morning we can be asked to move over to program Y. And program Y has a different program manager and all of a sudden you have a new boss. And so my off the top, um, um, not admonition, but uh, uh, suggestion is that no matter who they are and what they're about, treat them with respect. Um, interestingly enough, about an hour or so ago, I heard the same thing from a, a, new, a new person in town. His name is Joseph Biden. And those of you following what he just did, in effect, he <laughs> He said more or less the same thing. Treat everybody with respect. If you're not gonna do that, I'm gonna fire you. Um, I'm not gonna go as far as uh, Joseph Biden, but um, that's my number 13. Okay, did anybody hear that uh, from uh, Biden today? Treat everybody with respect. Um, number 14, consider lateral thinking. Lateral thinking is uh, one of the topics I discuss in some detail in a book I wrote some years ago on thinking. Lateral thinking basically says uh, if you've been thinking a certain way for years and years and years and years, um, uh, call a halt to it and basically consider what um, a gentleman named De Bono wrote several books about, which is uh, shift gears into lateral thinking. Now, what is lateral thinking? Well, maybe an example might be, uh, let's suppose you're a researcher in the field of uh, um, finding a cure for cancer, and you've been working on uh, radiation, and you're pretty far down the road in radiation, but you just, find out that you're not getting the results that you want to get. And this is just an example. You're not getting the results you want to get. So you basically uh, say to yourself, well, what are some other approaches to the cure for cancer and who's working on them? And let me, let me just stop what I'm doing for a while and uh, look, look over there and see what they're doing and what they're up to. Uh, now that takes a certain amount of courage to basically not abandon what you've been doing, but basically have some belief that um, if you tackle uh, um, a new uh, tackle a problem a new way, you may find that your way of thinking leads to a better answer than even what's in the literature. So um, um, I would uh, this this. Uh, idea was put forth by Edward de Bono, a, a British researcher and uh, psychoanalyst. Okay, um, number 15. Um, I have found that over the years, um, a, a deep and uh, um, a deep look at functional decomposition of the systems that I've been working on leads to some very good results including um, uh, overdoing what analysis it is that you're doing and including finding that there are pieces of the system that you thoroughly have neglected. So uh, take another look at that and, um, and uh, see if you're doing it the right way. Uh, there are some areas of omission and commission that go along with that. Okay. Um, number 16, do a formal risk analysis and um, mitigation study. By formal, I mean um, take a good hard look at the system you're working on and take a hard look at 
the different risks that you uh, that you may face in in uh, in what you're doing. That goes beyond pure technical risk um, into uh, uh, risk to society, for example, uh, risks having to do with sustainability of the system, and so on. And the mitigation part of it, I think, is is real, and this is sort of coupled to the redundancy matter. If you have a risk, as we had with Challenger, single point failure, um, a lot of contention about it. Um, our physicist friend, Dr. Feynman, was asked to look at it and he figured out, uh, well, here's what the problem was and here's what you should have done about it. So I think that all, all of the programs that we work on of the size and shape and high risks that we, we face today um, deserve a formal risk and mitigation analysis. Okay, um, let's move on to uh, number 17. Yeah, um, read and reread the contract type and the list of deliverables. Um, as senior systems engineers these days, the contract that you're working on is not above and beyond what you should be uh, should should look at more than once. Contract type is a, a, a very interesting one because, of course, we work on different types like cost plus type contracts, uh, T and M contracts, uh, firm fixed price contracts. And you should be aware of what type of contract you have obligated yourself to do. Excuse me for a minute. Now the type of contract that you should be looking into in great detail is known as firm fixed price. Firm fixed price of course says you have a statement of work. You're supposed to do everything that's called out in the statement of work. If you don't do that, the obligation of the customer is to come back at you and say, well, you, you missed these um, and you, you, uh, I want you to go back to work and fix, uh, go do them. Um, if it's a firm fixed price contract, you have the obligation to keep working until you fulfill every single obligation under the contract. So that, of course, leads you to the list of deliverables. What are my obligations under this contract? And um, along with that is usually the idea of uh, write, down, write down on a piece of paper what it would take, what are the acceptance criteria for each of the deliverables. So um, um, this is a particularly important thing uh, as you take on management responsibilities uh, in your systems engineering work. Okay, um, number 18. Generalize your view to set the stage for and to help with growth. Senior systems engineers are expected to help with the growth of the enterprise. Um, certainly growth of the specific contract that you're working under as per new task orders and certainly the st strategic d direction uh, of where you might be headed. So I'm going to tell a, a short, a very short uh, story about that in terms of generalizing one's view. Um, so it turns out that the Association of American Railroads is getting together for their annual strategic planning work. So they got the leaders in at the AAR together doing their strategic planning. And they asked the fundamental question, which was, um, what's the fundamental question, strategic question? What business are we in? Um, they spent a couple of days talking about it. And they came to the conclusion, these leaders at the Association of American Railroads, they came to the conclusion that they were in the railroading business. 
what other conclusions might they have come to? Well, another conclusion might have been we're in we're not we're not in the railroading business. We're in the transportation business. Well, uh, they missed that one, and as a result, the people from the railroads basically never got into air transportation, um, except peripherally. So, in terms of your position as an engineer on a particular program. Look at the program in a more generalized view. If you're a, a maker of um, radars, um, airport surveillance, ASRs, airport surveillance ra radars, for example, ask yourself the question, what, uh, what business are we in? Well, you could be in the airport surveillance radar business. I hope you're in that business. But you could also ask yourself, uh, we're in the radar business. Uh, maybe we're in the harbor radar business or want to be in the harbor radar business. So that's kind of partly generalizing your view and also thinking laterally. Um, part of your job as senior engineer, senior systems engineer in particular, is to uh, think more broadly about the system you're working on and the systems you might be working on. Okay, number 19, um, integrating stovepipes. Um, this is a topic near and dear to my heart because I've run into many situations dealing with it. But here's one example. Some years ago, I was on a Navy advisory group panel uh, and there were know, about six or seven of us on the panel and we were given responsibility for overseeing um, a particular program. It happened to be a naval intelligence program. And um, we would meet every now and then. And we would observe that the program seems to be getting, uh, each time we uh, met, into more and more trouble. And uh, we observed that the system uh, ground rules basically were to take uh, some number, like six or seven stovepipe systems, and integrate them. That was the original charge. That was the original responsibility. That were the, those, those were the terms of reference for the original contract. So through that experience and a lot of discussion uh, about it, most of us came to the conclusion um, be very, very careful about integrating stovepipes and consider the possibility that they might not be integrable, if that's a real word. Um, many of these stovepipes were developed by different contractors, different software, different hardware, uh, just completely different uh, sets of conditions. And then somebody is picked happily to do the impossible, integrate stovepipes that are not integrable. By not being integrable, what I mean to say is that they, they might be integrable, but not within the parameters of cost and time that you have out for that program. So one thing to do when you are looking at new, new programs take a very hard look at whether basically they're asking you to integrate a given set of stovepipes, that is to say a set of stovepipes that exist, add two or three more stovepipes and do it all within cost and time um, parameters. So if you've run into this problem before, it makes sense that you be very cautious about about this. Another um, brief story I have about it is that I read a uh, directive by a very senior person in the government some years ago in the Intel community. And the essence of the directive basically said, I run, I run this, uh, uh, this part of the universe, happens to be a big, big chunk of the in Intel universe. And from this point forward, 
um, I, I'm not requesting, but I am insisting that all my contractors integrate uh, these following stovepipes. So in other words, we have a directive coming from the top of a, a government um, agency saying, for, we're going to do this. Well, guess what? Much of it was not doable. So again, um, you have to be in a position to say, uh, you can't get there from here. Um, if you want to get there from here, we need twice the time and twice the money. How about that? Um, we, we still can't do the impossible, us uh, systems engineers. Um, I have a note here from Dave uh, to everyone. What was it, Dave? Dave? Talk, yeah, talking to David Johnston. You Dave, know? yeah, you want to... Oh, oh, I, I, I've, I've noticed um, from my work with the FAA that I joined about a year and a half ago that every once in a while these representatives from Space Force have a lecture, have a, they're like a sponsored, um, not a sponsored, but an official guest on one of the many Zoom meetings I go to a month. And so uh -huh. an offshoot of just normal FAA contracting for recruiting purposes from the government point of view is start getting into Space Force contracts. Um, and I was, I was on positive train control, then I moved in the FAA, which is all transportation. And the old air rink in Annapolis became Rockwell Collins, and they had an aerospace division, and they had a smaller positive train control division, which made, which returned a lot less money. But they were really uh, made their business creating reliable computer networks. But you have to look at what kind of customers you've got out there. So the, the government leader, the mid-level government leader was interested in, like, when I threw out Space Force as a way to get new clients or new customers. So. Hmm. I just figured I'd throw any, that in the chat. Any, uh, are you having success so far or a lot of resistance? Uh, Space Force is just getting off the ground. There's maybe only 50 people in the D.C. area that I know that, well, maybe that just needs to grow. And then part of Space Force is out in Colorado, I think. But, uh -huh. Yeah. But I'm, I now am getting toward the last five years of my career. So I'm trying to figure out how to end my career. But maybe, uh -huh. it, will never, maybe it will never end. I don't know. It's like. Yeah. Well, it certainly sounds like an interesting issue. Um, right. I mean, and, uh, I had one, one, two thirds of my career without the transportation stuff was defense. One third was NASA and satellite stuff. So this might combine it in a sort of an unclassified way. I don't know. We'll terrific. have to see. Terrific. Yes. Keep an I'm eye curious. on it. I'm curious to see what, uh, what the government does in the uh, Space Force uh, area. Uh, right, and I work. I work for an 8A company that just graduated after 15 years. So if I know uh, some other people that want to form an 8A company and go after Space Force stuff, mm -hmm. I know a few people that could do that. Yeah, yeah. Apropos of that, um, just a quick um, story. Um, in the company I was with for some years, uh, we worked a lot with uh, NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center. As did and, I. Uh, and uh, developed some uh, interesting capabilities, um, one of which was to um, build some models for how to uh, position, locate in space. Um, we worked on a system uh, to do exactly that, the uh, interrogation, recording, and location system for uh, Goddard. So having developed these models, they were sort of off the shelf at, at one point. We got a bunch of guys together and apropos of um, generalizing, we said, who else, um, what, what business are we in and who else might be interested? Well, and there's certainly enough talent in the DC area to create a Space Force contractor firm, whether it's 8A or not, but 8A gives you, you're talking about the types of contracts. The best one would be sole source, a cost plus, I don't know, in 10 years, I don't yeah. know, with no option, you're not going to find those that much anymore. But with the 8A companies, they can get some set aside money. So it's not totally competitive bid. So that's a, just a marketing point. Yeah, yeah. Sounds good. Yes. Okay, yeah. Move, moving on. Uh, the last uh, item for t today is uh, rethink your modeling and simulation approach. Um, I'm a strong supporter of modeling and simulation and um, sort of going back to my experience with Captain 
Admiral Wayne Meyer, basically what he was asking me to do, or what I proposed that we do, was to build a, um, a model of the basic point defense surface missile system. And so that got into the question of uh, how do you do that and, and what is a model of that system? And um, many companies um, these days are uh, working on uh, modeling and simulation. And there's a conventional wisdom, if you will, in the um, systems engineering community to support uh, model-based systems engineering, which I definitely support. But my approach to that would, would broaden, basically. Basically, I'm asking you to broaden your thinking about model-based systems engineering and think in terms of simulating the systems that you're uh, not only working on, but thinking of working on. Uh, typically, um, successful efforts in, in those kinds of simulations are oriented to the operation, to an, uh, an operation rather than a technical behavior. Uh, so um, that's number 20, which is to uh, A, support modeling and simulation, but broaden your thinking about how to approach that problem and, um, and see uh, where that might take you. Okay, well, we're at a point where we're about six minutes to the hour. Um, I'd like to open it up to any other points that come to mind, and uh, then we'll be done. I think Steve Sutton there had a question. Steve, sure. Yeah. And take to unmute yourself and ask the question live. Do you want me to ask the question? Yeah, please do. Okay. Uh, you've talked a lot about uh, interfacing with customers and customers' uh, viewpoints and how to manage their viewpoint for best advantage to, so for their projects. But it seems to me that many customers have, a, I'll call it tunnel vision or, re or a localized vision. And how do you educate them to think uh, a little bit more abstractly? Like your example with railroads versus transportation? Yeah, so well, that, you, you, you just have to put this particulars in front of them and say, have you thought about, uh, what do you think about, uh, do you have any, any ideas about, uh, you know, over lunch, uh, as long as they pay for it. <laughs> uh, yeah, um, there's, there's many ways to approach a customer just by being low key and uh, asking, asking questions. More, it's, a, more, it's more a question, uh, asking questions of your customer, but don't overpower him or her. Okay. Thank you, Howard. You're very welcome. What I found, again, going back to the Admiral, is that uh, the Admiral was willing to talk. He was very happy to talk in, in point of fact. And um, you just uh, listen, listen very hard. Uh, as to what's there and what's, uh, what's not there. Any other questions or comments, please? Yeah, this is Dave Fabley. Um, Dave, yeah. I said, how you doing? I got a question in which I sent in there, but it says, I, I, I find one item is, is a lot of, some people, you have to really, as a system engineer, you gotta really understand the problem the customer or the sponsor is really trying to solve. Sometimes they come up with maybe they have some, you know, erroneous or slightly off base, um, understanding what the problem is because you obviously you have a solution to the wrong problem doesn't do anybody any good so I, I found that to be true that that one, one of the things we tend to lightly skip over is what's the real problem they're trying to solve so I want to see what, what some of your experience has been in your career have you found that to be true as well well first I would I would 100% uh, agree um, I, I think I can go back to a, a problem that um, on a contract I had with the uh, Federal Aviation Administration. Um, the problem that they um, thought they had was dressed up in uh, terms of uh, building a, a NAS model, a National Aviation System model. And uh, that was the problem they were trying to solve. And uh, when I got into it with them, uh, it turned out that they, uh, 
um, they hadn't really committed to do it, <laughs> doing that. <clears throat> so where it, where it came to, uh, to me to worry about was to say, uh, here, here are the terms and conditions on the contract that we just signed with you. But uh, how about considering uh, moving to the left about three degrees and uh, re re uh, restructuring the problem uh, in this particular way? Uh, in, in short form, what I would basically call the restructuring was to build a model of models. Now, as systems engineers, we have a, a topic we've been working on for years now, system of systems engineering. So I would put that example uh, as uh, on the table as uh, an ex something I ran into. How do you build a model of models? And I ran into that with the FAA and the National Aviation System model. I hope that helps. <laughs> Uh, yes, Dr. Eisenman, this is Mark. Yes. I've got a question. Um, a lot of contracts and uh, system developments at some point are constrained by cost. So at what point do you um, consider a build to cost if your, your customer is so constrained? Because if you, if you start at the beginning, I think it it's totally limits the design. Say again what you. Um, I was just wondering what your experience was as to when you, <clears throat> when you constrain, at what point in the process you begin to constrain a system uh, design by, by cost. If the customer wants essentially a build to cost kind of system, where they don't want to consider all options. That gets to uh, what what comes to my mind about that is that we talked about architecting alternatives. And we talked um, again a few months ago about the notion that there are basically three alternatives in terms of um, in terms of uh, building um, um, systems. Um, the low cost alternative is is the one, of course, where you're sort of linear um, in effectiveness with cost. The uh, knee of the curve solution, which is basically where you start to pay more and more price for every element of improvement in performance. And then the high end system is your high cost, high uh, performance system. So basically, if the customer is in a place where they can only afford the low cost system, then I think our obligation as systems engineers uh, is to offer them that solution. And when they say they want the, um, the high effectiveness, uh, the high performing system, and they don't have the money for it, again, our obligation is to say, uh, sorry, that's, that's not, <laughs> you can't get there from here. So it's that, that overall perspective about um, um, designing systems. Thank you. Yeah. Sarah, do you, do you want to say something? No, I was ask, answering the question that I have no idea how to pronounce, how to pronounce his name asked. It's, uh, it's, it's Fadal. Um, uh, hi. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm Dali Lin from the UK. Uh, I really uh, enjoyed your, your question and, and thanks to Douglas and, and Sarah for the for the responses. I, the question I was asking was if you've got any advice for younger systems engineers starting out who are not yet senior systems engineers. Talk to the talk to your um, talk a lot to your neighbor, your your guy who sits at the desk next to you, and try to get some private time uh, if possible with your customer so you. you uh, tackle some of these questions like what is the real problem and what is uh, my customer really thinking about notwithstanding what's in the statement of work. So um, uh, talk to as many um, um, uh, senior people as possible and ask a lot of questions. Okay so it's Thank eight o'clock and um, I think we'll 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 stop it here, but okay. uh, maybe we're uh, 
uh, have some time after the meeting for anyone who wants to stick around. Um, so what I want to do now is um, is actually uh, I want to present uh, a certificate if I can find it here. Where is it? My board phone. Oh, here it is. Share. All right. Uh, Dr. Eisner, if, if we were doing this live, I would present you with this in a nice framed format, but <laughs> okay. uh, it's virtual, so so here you are. I'll email you a, a copy of it, but we want to thank you um, for delivering this lecture tonight, and it's been a real pleasure, as always. Um, thank you. Thank you. Much appreciated. Yep. So now, the, now I'd like to move into the uh, raffle and we're going to raffle off um, the um, the book here if I can pull up the oops wrong one. <laughs> oh no no that's right wait a second hold on I got the wrong can people see the wheel yeah wow okay. I had the attendance spreadsheet up there so uh, that's wow cool. that's really cool so I joined I joined late, so I don't even know if I'm going to be on it's, that. It's even got the logo right in the center. You know, it's just like a you know, wheel of fortune here. So I'm going to spin the wheel of fortune to see who wins tonight's uh, door prize. You need a Vanna White. I do. Would you like to volunteer for that? No. <laughs> All right, Tim Newell. Tim Newell, congratulations. And I'll use your registration information um to uh contact you to uh, get an e um mailing address oh, it was all those 